And if we could have your name and address, please. My name is Elizabeth Maslin, and I live at Six Weatherstone Court within the walls of the Grand Estate. Living on Weatherstone is unique. At night, the only sound one can hear is the occasional baying of coyotes. Recently, a salesman came to my door, and when I opened it, he was staring in the opposite direction. Ms. Mason, can you? I'm sorry to interrupt you, just so everyone can hear. Uh, just you'll have to get quite close to the mic. Here. Okay. Um, recently, a salesman came to my door, and when I opened it, he was staring in the opposite direction, across the street, at the former Grand Stables, built in 1919. He, when he turned around, he said to me. I used to live in England, and I feel like I'm on an English estate. Where am I? When he turned around, I told him, this is the Rand estate, and you were in Ontario. Most of my neighbors are retired. A few work outside the home, while others have home offices and telecommute. Several others live elsewhere and come on weekends. Everyone values the peace and tranquility of being either within the Rand estate walls or near them. Now I shall put on my historian's hat and tell you briefly about the history of the Dixon Lan Lansing Rand Estate, which is the oldest and most historic estate in Ontario and perhaps all of Canada. Given to Peter Russell, the Receiver General of Upper Canada, as a crown grant by John Gray Simcoe in 1796, who was sold to William Dixon, who had followed his cousin Robert Hamilton of Queenston to Canada. Dixon owned a house about where the Balsat Cafe stands today on King Street. But in 1809, built one where the present Randwood House stands. Since we are about to memorialize the 200th anniversary of the War of 1812, you might be interested in knowing that Dixon's house was the first in town to be torched by the retreating Americans in December 1813. Dixon's wife, Charlotte, probably the origin of Charlotte Street, was carried from her house on her sick bed, which was placed in the snow and she watched her house burn. Following the war, William Dixon developed the gold area while his son Robert built the present brick house on the foundation of his parents' burned home. The Dixons lived there until 1873, when it was bought by the American Civil War General Lansing. The Lansing family, the last of whom died in Niagara in 1974, sold what they called Woodlawn to George Graham I, a prominent banker in Buffalo, who began massive changes on the grounds with the intention of making Graham Wood one of the show places of Canada. Before his death in 1919, the historically designated stables, which faced Weatherstone, and the wall which surrounds Graham Wood on three sides would be gone. His son, George Graham II, hired the <coughs> Dunnington Grubbs, the first professional landscape architects in Canada, to design the many other features on the ground, which include the first swimming pool in town and its pavilion, the majestic reflecting pool which one sees from the John Street entrance, the gatehouse on Charlotte Street, and the gazebo like train station that one can see when walking along the Heritage Trail, the former Mich Michigan Central Railroad line by the back Grand Estate Wall. Roses, perennials, and other plantings came from Sheridan Nurseries and are described in this 1930 magazine article, which I found at the University of Toronto Railroad Road. I will talk about this Canadian Homes and Gardens article later because its descriptions are significant. Eventually, part of the Rand Estate was sold and Christopher Street and Weatherstone Court were built. The front portion, including the White Sheets House, the Brick Brandwood House, and the coach house, which probably was built about 1810, were sold to the Devonian Foundation of Alberta and then in turn to William Fox at the London School of Philosophy. This 13.1 acres of property was bought by Romance Cars Incorporated in 2006. Calvin Brown continues to own a laneway which contains a large buffer of trees between Randwood and Brunswick House, owned by Trisha Romance and Gary Peterson. And he still retains. 25 acres of land behind Randall the House and the Romance Peterson House down to the old railroad tracks. I know I've gone on a long time about the history of the Randwood estate, but the point I'm trying to make is that the Dixon, Lansing, and Rand families have cherished this section of Niagara for 213 years now and have passed the property on to their children and grandchildren. 
I saw George Graham, the first great great grandchildren, enjoying the Dunnington Grub swimming with the Lillian just last month. I would like to make comments on two of the reports and the many hundreds of pages long proposal for the Rand Wood Estate Resort Hotel. The first is the Heritage Impact Assessment Report. I wish the owners who were asking for the setting change to commercial had actually read the Heritage Report before making the site plan and architectural drawings and followed its recommendations. The report talks of the significance of the cultural heritage landscape in section 4.2 and says, it is a testament to the it is a testament to the landscape design of the Randwood Estate that its gardens have so effortlessly endured the passing of time and their sense of romance and fantasy have only been collected by so very few examples of Beaux-Arts landscape architecture remain in Canada. And what are the current owners going to do with the site of the Rand's rural gardens, which are described in the 1930 magazine article as having a conical roofed summer house embowered in pink ramblers at the entrance to the rows of perennial gardens? That is precisely where the 40-foot tie hotel edition is to be placed. So much for their claim of maintaining the cultural and historical and horticultural landscape. The Heritage Impact Assessment goes on to say that the proposed large event pavilion for up to 250 wedding guests will impact the heritage character of the landscape, as will the realignment and widening of the main driveway, which the owners must do to allow emergency vehicles to access the hotel restaurant its fall. By the way, this pavilion, by my measurement of the site plan, is to be only six meters from one mile creek, whereas the Conservation Authority has mandated no new building within 15 meters of the creek. It also says that the expansion of the drive will impact the existing landscape through tree removals and the infringement into the green space associated with the front portion of the property. It says that putting in the new roadway system in the parking garage will, quote, require tree removals, including significant native species, such as a large shagbark hickory, and the removal of any of the large caliper trees in the lawn area would have a significant impact on the overall character of the site. The report goes on to say that the design for the additions and new freestanding defense pavilion is based on a romantic interpretation of French chateau architectural style with prominent mansard roofs, ornamental balustrades, and cresting French windows with decorative surrounds and balconies, glass conservatories, and portico entrances. In other situations, heritage conservation principles would encourage new buildings to be built in the current vernacular. Many of us remember who is listed as being one of the architects at the presentation of the town offices last September. The report goes on to the short-term and long-term conservation measures, none of which are addressed by the Hind Paul proposal dated June 2010. It should be noted especially that the conservation measures call for all heritage landscape features to remain, and yet the hotel to be placed where the ranch Japanese tea house and formal gardens. I'll try to quickly summarize the deficiencies of the archaeological assessment report. Only the manicure belong was studied. No area that was, quote, previously disturbed, wet, or an environmental protected area was studied. In other words, the surroundings of One Mile Creek, which is used by the natives to go from the river to the lake, where they would link up with the path along Lake Ontario, was ignored and the areas beside the 1810 coach house and the 1825 house were not studied. And don't forget that I said that the Dixon house was burned by American soldiers that would have exited Fort George, run across the commons with torches in hand to set fire. Only one test book was dug in the area between John Street and Rand with the house. And it was deemed to be an, quote, archaeological location not requiring stage three excavations. I think that another archaeological company besides Archaeologics Incorporated of London would and should dig test pits and other areas of the property. Perhaps they will come up with some of the artifacts described in this Globe and Mail article of September 21st 
entitled Digging Up Downtown Halifax Oil Roots. After all, William Dixon had 6,000 books in his library when his house was burnt. He was definitely a wealthy man. So the question is what to do with the property that Trisha Romance, Gary Peterson, and Ken Fowler owned in order to preserve its historical, cultural, and horticultural heritage. And something definitely must be done soon. The last time I bicycled around the estate when the foxes owned it was in the summer of 2005. The grounds and plantings were meticulously cared for, and Carol Fox said that they were spending $2 million a year on its end. Then the property was bought in the summer of 2006. The gates locked and eventually no trespassing signs were up around the perimeter. When one looks through the gates or a hedge, one sees that the grass is brown and the flowers have disappeared. I would like to see a small country hotel like those at Langdon Hall in Ontario and the Royal Golf Inn in New York State in way up there. The foxes have already added on to the original house. There are numerous bedrooms, two kitchens, and a solarium. Tennis courts and, a small, and small parking areas are already there, and with the addition of a swimming pool and revitalization of the Dunnington Park landscape, it would make a lovely inn. But I absolutely do not want to see an outdoor pavilion with rock bands playing for the wedding guests, nor a parking garage with a new windy road leading off Chelsea Street. My neighbors, my husband and I, moved to the Rand Estate for <coughs> peace, quiet, and tranquil. I hope that you will not take that away from us. Thank you. My name is Helen Brown. And uh, Mrs. Brown, just speak right into that. You might want to pull it down a little bit. There we go. Thank you. Uh, my name is Helen Brown. I live at 6 Christopher Street in Niagara on the Lake. Fortunately, most of the comments that I would have made have been expressed admirably by the previous speakers. However, I would like to make one or two comments. Forget this sentimental picture that has been presented to us of a romantic inn and artist center we've been subjected to this evening. These developers are hiding behind the artist's canvas. Make no mistake, this is all about money, big money. Its purpose is to get the zoning change to commercial. It's about adding value to one property at the expense of the neighborhood properties. This only change would irrevocably change the character of Niagara on the faith. My husband and I have enjoyed our uh, living here since 1996. And we have trusted, we came here and trusting in the town's official plan to protect our investment and quiet enjoyment of our garden and home. The official plan specifically states to prevent the intrusion of commercial uses into residential areas. I believe that this is a gross intrusion into a well-established residential area. This clause alone should guarantee the refusal of the proposal. Any of this, uh, I believe, if it were granted, uh, is the thin edge of the wedge. The residential property, any residential property in Niagara on the day in the future could be sold even unwittingly to a business person with commercial intent. It, it leaves the every residential property open to commercial exploitation. I absolutely, categorically, reject this zoning change to commercial zoning for the Rand Estate. And as the signatures of our, in our petition to reject this proposal attest to so do many other residents in Niagara on the Lake. We have a further 200 at least signatures to hand in tonight. I ask your support to reject outright this zoning change. Thank you. 